Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 56 of Humanity Rising, uh, which is brought to you by Ubiquity University and over 300 partnering uh, organizations. As our offering uh, to the world to allow people from everywhere to come together on a daily basis between five o'clock and seven o'clock p.m. Central European time to share how they're doing as we all navigate through this extraordinary pandemic. It's one of these uh, unprecedented uh, global events where quite literally everyone everywhere is undergoing the same experience and therefore we're all essentially in the same conversation. And this gives us a remarkable opportunity uh, to come together uh, with uh, the context of a shared experience to take counsel together as to how we can more effectively enhance our strategic capacity to produce a world that is more sustainable, abundant, healthy, and in alignment with natural systems. That's what Humanity Rising essentially has been convened to achieve, bringing people together to share what's happening and to think through how we can be more effective. Scientists are telling us we're running out of time. At the center of the crises is runaway climate change. We're seeing the news virtually every day on the media uh, and the major indicators are all seemingly getting worse and worse, not better and better. So in some way, somehow, the progressive community, meaning all those everywhere that are working day in and day out for a better world, have got to figure out how we can create a critical mass of effectiveness. We've divided uh, the program into three basic themes. One is strategies for change. Number two is new mindsets for a new world. How do we change consciousness? And number three is solutions that are actually making a difference. And it's in that solutions making a difference program that today's session fits. It's about how we create thriving human habitats. Yesterday, we had a marvelous dialogue between Peter Mary, the chief innovation officer at uh, Ubiquity University and Hans Andeweg, uh, who's the founder of Bioenergetics, about how humans can tune in to the ecology, not just in one little local area, but across continents and take a measure of the ecological energetic health of an entire sphere and begin to work energetically to upgrade the ecosystem. And what they find is when you start to upgrade the ecosystem, whether it's a polluted river or uh, a mountain that's been deforested uh, or agricultural land that has been made toxic by chemicals, once you begin to upgrade it, it starts to thrive. Birds and animals start to come back, fish come back into the, into the streams. And it was an inspiring tale of how uh, humans are learning intelligible communication with the natural ecosystem. Today, we turn our attentions to communities, how uh, humans can build thriving habitats, thriving communities on the earth that are not only in alignment with natural systems, but also uh, capable of creating social harmony and social generativity. Uh, and to introduce our program today, I wanna introduce Marilyn Hamilton, who's the founder of Integral uh, Cities Meshworks, 
Uh, she's been working tirelessly for decades uh, for human betterment. And uh, the importance of cities is that they may end up being that one area that's just large enough, but also just small enough to make a difference. And so Marilyn, I'm very pleased that uh, you're with us today and I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jim. It's just a privilege to be here. I have so enjoyed the ways that you've introduced every session on Humanity Rising. So I'm delighted to take on the opportunity to explore how can we create thriving human habitats. And I have a wonderful panel that will be speaking after I do an introduction here. And uh, we are going to explore the city and the ecoregion, our human habitats at multiple scales. In order to tell my story, I'm going to share my screen and that will help our audience to be able to follow some of the story and we'll be able to supply this information to them as well through our blogs and through the links that we'll give at the end of the session. So in sharing my screen, we are going to explore as a panel, how do we co-create solutions for thriving human habitats? So none of us on the panel is thinking that we're going to be able to do this alone. So we think that looking at multiple scales of human habitats, we will embrace eco-villages and cities and eco-regions and the whole planet. And we will also explore how we can build connections and feedback loops within and across human habitats to create well-being at both a local and planetary scale. Jim, who often is living in Amsterdam, might be delighted to know that every year Integral City awards an Integral City of the Year award. And in 2019, it was Amsterdam. And if you want to find out the details of why we awarded this award to Amsterdam, you can go and look at the blog link that's on this, this slide. But in general, let me just say, Amsterdam, we think of as an integral city because it is using the four voices of the city. I'll tell you about those four voices in a few minutes. We think that it demonstrates all the 12 intelligences of a human system that makes up the city. In fact, they've had a conference for the last two years called We Make the City. And when we make the city the way we're imagining this, the city can make the planet. And then we can have a planet of integral cities that I think is going to become something like a super organism. And it will be what I think is being called forth by Gaia herself, Gaia's reflective organ. Yesterday we heard Hans and Peter explore how Europe is actually a super organ of Gaia. So today we'll look a little bit closer at the individual cities that make up that super organ and some of the others in the rest of the world. Besides Amsterdam, Integral City has had the surprise and delight of working with Russia. In 2014, the Russians translated my first book. And here you can see a beautiful infographic of how they're actually illustrating the master code of care for self, others, place, and planet. Imagining how to thrive as human hives, which is what I call cities, that are Gaia's reflective organs, I want to share with you in your imagination. So I ask you to get comfortable in your chairs as you're watching this and imagine that you're going to participate in a dance in three acts. We start off with a little prelude. So imagine some music in the background and we're going to wake up the human hive. Imagine the city as a human hive, a living organ of Gaia who has a purpose that is in service to Gaia's well-being and resilience and is embraced by its citizens. Imagine human hives who can resource their purpose with internal and external resources and funding. Imagine the human hive as a living innovation ecosystem where we enable the connections between the four voices of the city, the citizens, the civil society, city and institutional managers, business innovators. 
so that they not only thrive today, but create a legacy of life conditions for the next generations to evolve and thrive themselves. Imagine human hives who know how to connect. They can map their existing connections, align people to purpose and priorities, and they can amplify what works, let go of what doesn't, and continuously improve the value they contribute to Gaia. Imagine human hives who learn from each other like we're doing today and develop the whole system of human hives in an evolutionary direction. If we can imagine such a city, we can imagine creating and implementing plans for the global scale challenges of pandemic, climate adaptation, energy shifts, water management, and food and security and cultural evolution. To do so, we can imagine how to release resources now trapped in city sectors, silos, and stovepipes. We can imagine the frameworks, the tools and processes that catalyze new conversations, build on the underlying values, and recalibrate the assets, capacities, and capitals into meshworks of economic, environmental, social, and cultural interests. We can imagine creating the model for community engagement, city development, business strategies, and communication technologies to evolve the intelligences in our cities into thriving human hives. So with that prelude, let's just pause for a moment. Let's take a little intermission and let's look at Gaia's human hives in 2020. I've already shared with you that I think of the city as a natural system, a human hive. And I've done the research to identify the 12 intelligence that show that cities are complex, adaptive living systems that they would have to manifest if we wish to res resiliently live and survive and evolve. I think 2020 will mark a significant year of backcasting from the forward projection of imagining the city as a human hive. What wants to and needs to happen in 2020 for our next steps as a human hive to emerge? That's the question we're asking today. I would say we need to commit to intelligence number one that I've named as eco-intelligence. We need to thread that through the master code of care, caring for self so that we can care for others, so that we can care for the place and our planet and to see how all that will change our individual behavior, relationships with others, respect for our ecology and aligning our human ethos with the whole of life on Mother Earth. We will look back on 2020 and witness how the global pandemic became a universal, non-local experience that demanded our acknowledgement of our inextricable interconnectedness with one another and the Earth. We will both fear for and care for our families to a deep level of appreciation. We will translate what our children can expect for their legacy into changes in our own behaviors. We will translate our lessons of rapid response from COVID-19 to capacities that sanely respond to climate change and its impacts on our shared ecology. In 2020, we will see extensions of Black Lives Matter and Me Too movements from individual experience or blame of one race or gender to other races and genders. Those shifts will often be painful, but they will catalyze our evolving into respect for all humans. We will continue the journey to understanding our fractal relationship to energy, massively shifted by lockdown and economic obstructions to information where IT has super boost, is super boosted because of our physical distancing and matter in the form of actions, systems, infrastructures, and their undeniable embeddedness in the intelligence of nature. Cosmic holograms will be the new math for our children. The blue planet will be the basis for our new morals and relationship to all life including ecocide and other terrors. Greta Thunberg, 
demands that we listen to the science, while world unity mesh workers and heart math experts reveal the power of heart intelligence. All together with activists for the plastic revolution and extinction revolution, these movements will ignite citizen voices in countries around the world, demanding that diversity generators take responsibility and resource allocators wake up to their real job of creating well-being. And the third sector or civil society will claim their voice of integration and demand that spirit be welcomed back as the guiding force for life enhancing decisions. We will rediscover lessons from the end of slavery and the end of ecocide to see the patterns of decisions, actions, legislation, and governance that we must call into existence in 2020 so that all our targets for 2025, 2035, and beyond can be met. We will heal the deep rifts of trauma that plague our morphogenic fields. And we will unlearn the ancient power of shaming and heal it with love to transform the millennials and their children into a force for good. So with that intermission, let us now imagine how your city dances like a thriving innovation ecosystem. Act one begins with deep inner listening. Imagine your city has a sense of its own spirit and discovers its purpose, its purpose in service to the well being of its ecoregion and the planet. Imagine that your city valued its values, history, traditions, and culture so that it conserves what works well and teaches it or shares with others, including children, youth, seniors, business, civil society, and city hall. Imagine that your city was open to creative change so that could place, replace what does not work well with what can work better and even inspire people to want more change. Imagine that your city discovers the wisdom and resources to create itself as a valued and valuable city for its citizens, families, organizations, communities, neighborhoods, sectors, state, and country. Act two, where work is love in action. Imagine that your city appreciates the great diversity in the city, from workers who produce value, to innovators and artists who generate diversity, to investors and resource allocators who find and manage resources for worthy projects, to integrators who see the city as alive for humans as a beehive is for bees. Imagine that your city has an innovation ecosystem that provides it with a thriving economy that draws on its history of success in manufacturing value and co-creates new opportunities through innovation laboratories at its universities and businesses. Imagine that your city's education and training sectors in conjunction with business and civil society committed to the high school graduation as a minimum target for its children, to co-op and intern opportunities for youth, and with governments created the conditions for full employment for all adults. Imagine that all students in your city learn in school mutual trust and respect, how to dialogue with others, how to cooperate through teamwork with others, and how to coordinate projects and processes to produce life-giving results. Imagine that your city commits to balancing interests for a healthy economy and well-being among its citizens through engaging with all the voices of the city in making decisions, managing plans, and achieving goals. And now for Act 3. 
How do we choreograph with the intelligences of nature? Imagine that your city has an integrated sustainability plan so that it measures, tracks, and exchanges sustainability data related to energy, water, food, finance, economic production, and climate. That it shares internally with stakeholders and externally with other cities in the region. Imagine that your city understands how it adds value to the economy and environment and positions itself strategically in relation to other cities in the region, the eco-region, your nation, and the planet. Imagine that your city has excellent information systems that inform the decisions of not only City Hall, but all businesses, citizens, civil society, institutions, like healthcare, education, spiritual, eco-regions, and all government levels, state, regional, national. Imagine that the management of your city mesh works so well by integrating stakeholders that it is a model for other cities of its size in your ecoregion, your nation, your continent, and the world. Imagine that your city's ability to respond to stresses, health, environmental, economic, physical, cultural, social, psychological, at all levels of scale creates a resilient city because all stakeholders working together in a meshwork create the conditions for everyone in the city to communicate with each other willingly and regularly. Imagine that your city is fully optically, energetically IT wired so that all parts of the city could communicate internally and externally with the rest of the world. Imagine that your city practices transparent governance, accountability, and accessibility to information so that people feel safe to share, care, and relate to each other, their places, and the planet fairly. Imagine that your city balances efficient management with enough extra resources that the city is resilient to change, co-creating with the intelligences of nature. These imaginations are inspired by some of the speakers we've already heard on Humanity Rising, and many of them, including Jim, have pointed back to James Lovelock, creator of the Gaia hypothesis. He imagines that, Gaia's are, that humans are Gaia's reflective organs, and I say that actually the cities are the organs, and our organizations are her organelles, and we as individuals are her selves. Many of the speakers have created a whole field for us to speak into and imagine into today. Not only Jim, but also Jean Houston, who talked about archetypes. Gail Taylor, who talked about scaffolding and meshworking. I mentioned Elizabeth Saturis. In fact, all these imaginations for a living city have come from how she had describes living systems must operate in order to be coherent and resonant and emergent in our world. David Lorimer, who talked about whole world views and spirituality. Jude Curvan, with her holographic cosmology and world unity. Yesterday, as Jim mentioned, Hans and Peter on eco-intention. We've heard several panels on world economics, and we know that there's a whole week related to donut economics to come. I have written three books. And these books have explored the evolutionary intelligences of the integral city, how to do action research and discover place caring and place making, and how to reframe, reframe complex challenges for cities that have call, various qualities that many of our speakers have mentioned, that they are complex, adaptive, emergent, fractal, fractal intelligent, purposeful, and as we will discover today, multi-scalar and evolutionary. In the first quarter of this year, I had the privilege to curate another book called Urban Hub 20, Accelerating City Change in a VUCA World. The contributors to that book, there were 20, more than 20 of them, 
who imagined what it would be like if we all work together in one city. We are currently spread out around the world, but I asked them to imagine in our world that is so changeable at the moment, what would happen? Could we actually accelerate city change in one city? Today's panel, we will see, is going to take a little different perspective. And we're just about to get there, but I would like you to take from what I have to share with you that the natural system of human hives or integral cities have four voices, the citizens, the civic managers, the business innovators, and civil society or the third sector. And the plus one is all the other cities that any individual city relates to. Core to what is going to enable our cities to evolve as Jim pointed to, as being perhaps the most logical evolutionary human system to care for our planet is going to have to live I believe, through a master code of care, where we care for individuals, we care for others, so together we can care for our places and care for our planet. As I come now to complete my contribution, I would like to ask the tech, Rick, to play a short video. This video is actually something else that has come out of the work that I've had with Integral City in discovering five maps. And this little video will be like a pause between my introduction here and being able to listen to the rest of our panelists. So Rick, if you could just play that video, that would be great. that have evolved as we've been starting to think about how they're all fractal 
all holographic and blend into one another, starting with the source and the beautiful big three of beauty, truth, and goodness. So those of you who know the integral model will recognize that and we'll be able to just see gently how we hold these maps of an integral city of a human habitat as naturally evolving, naturally emerging. And now I'd love the pleasure to introduce what I would call our meta panel. So our meta panel today is actually going to explore through different scales, their experience with creating thriving human habitats. So we have five people on our panel starting with Martin Vanicki, who is with the Tamara Eco Community in Portugal, then Mark Moore, who is founder of Earthville and will be in Asia, or right now he's in uh, Denver, Colorado, I believe. Beth Saunders, who is the founder and author of Nest City and is in Edmonton, Canada. Kirsten Miller, who is the ED of Eco City Builders and the co-convener of Eco City World Summit and Lalit Kishore Bhatti, who is the urban planner for Oroville, India. So I would ask now for each of the speakers to come forward and I have asked them to speak for about 10 minutes and to give themselves a more full introduction. So I'd like now to call first on Martin. Thank you, Marilyn, and hello everyone. It's, um pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you for this inspiring visionary introduction. I am calling in from Tamara, which is an intentional community and a peace research and education center in southern Portugal. It's a very hot day today here in Portugal. Um, and yeah, this title of thriving human habitats uh, and also just hearing this great scope of your uh, of, of the vision that you were laying out I think uh, it made me really think about the the dimensions of which we are talking because when we when we are when we are looking at at what thriving human habitats mean uh, we are we are really looking into reimagining reinventing uh, much of the basic premises of, of human civilization right now. And um, this community that I'm part of uh, has started out over 40 years ago. I'm one of the people here in the next generation uh, where in the 70s, uh, a group of German radicals uh, started out actually fundamentally questioning the, the um, not only political realities, but also realizing that in order to create really thriving human life conditions, we would need to go to the, to the, to the foundations of our, of our culture and reimagine the social, psychological, erotic, spiritual, ethic foundations um, if we wanted to create a culture which is um, not only sustainable, but which actually corresponds um, to the longing with which we as humans come into this life. And I'm also struck by this title of um, thriving human habitats because when we look into habitats right now, they are the very opposite of thriving. They are decaying, they are disintegrating, they are falling apart. And I think this is not just, you know, an unintended side effect or something like this. It's the direct um, result of the way they have been um, designed. And I think, um, this is um, it, like when we when we think of how can we how can we change that how can we transform human habitats then it really comes down to the question um, not only of what kind of methods are we are we using are we are we shopping organic food or are we supplying our electricity from renewable sources or with which materials we build but actually it comes down to the very questions at the core of a culture so what is sacred. In, um, in a certain culture, in a certain community, in, a, in the whole of a civilization. And so when we look into the decaying, disintegrating uh, systems that are producing um, 
climate disruption, pandemics, uh, these obscene levels of uh, social inequality, um, I think it is a it is a consequence of the of, of the values that this culture has held as sacred, uh, and it is uh, a culture. It is it is those are those are systems of many people living together that follow the the priority of the most efficient satisfaction of material needs under the paradigm um, of power over. The priority lies in um, private wealth in uh, in private power in the hands of a few and you have this whole machine civilization and it really doesn't work because it disregards the principles of life and then there is the opposite experience um, which actually cultures throughout and communities in parallel to this whole development of this industrial capitalist society have had indigenous communities, resisting um, cultures, also yeah, here in, here in Tamara and other intentional communities, we've also tapped into this experience time and again. We see that actually life thrives naturally when we follow its principles, when we no longer try to uh, subjugate life to the principles of power and, and, and private profit, but when life and its principles are the underlying foundation um, for the design of human community, for our interaction with, with nature. So when we create and maintain social and ecological structures where the powers of nature around us, but also within us can actually unfold themselves freely. Um, we've seen this um, in, our, in our ecosystem. Uh, we are here in, in, the, in um, a region that is um, in progressive uh, the certification scientists have in a way given it up saying that in 20 to 30 years it would just be a desert and we have we could witness how in what a short time and Jim mentioned this in the beginning in what a short time an ecosystem can actually regenerate and activate an incredible um, hitherto latent potential of self-healing and regeneration powers when we um, actually we as humans perceive um, the principles of nature. In that case, it was um, us perceiving how does water actually want to move in an ecosystem. And when we, when we perceive that and create ecological structures that honor those principles of life again. So we have created um, something that we call a water retention landscape, which basically means that we have uh, implemented ecological measures that allow rainwater to, to filter into the um, ground and recharge the aquifers where it falls and it's been incredible to see how nature heals herself it's not us doing that but how nature heals herself uh, when water is again allowed to flow naturally um, and yeah how biodiversity returns how you have a how you have a regenerative water supply how um, you have the foundation for a regenerative food supply and um and at the same time, a big part of our research is on the question of how do actually people live together in a way that is sustainable? Because we know that even the best ecological solution, the most intelligent ideas for a new kind of economy, all of this, um, they will only function to the degree that people inhabiting those systems will actually be able to trust one another. And so... Um, yeah, what, what, what does it take to create a community um, that no longer falls apart due to the usual um, conflicts that people face when they move together more closely? If you, if you live in, in an isolated way, you might not uh, face the underlying um, di divisive um, structures and patterns that humans carry. But when you, when you want to restore community as a... As a, as a, as a as a foundation for human culture, you have a thousand conflicts coming up around love, around power, around money. And um, yeah, it, it, he, from our experience uh, from, of this community, you, you can really say this is, this is, the, this is the crucial point of, of whether human habitats will, will, will be able to thrive or not. Will people be able to, um, to, to find back actually remembering uh, memories of, of tribal ways of living in the framework of um, a, a, a globalized 21st century society. 
And um, we have found that um, social transparency is really an absolute core value, um, just as we have it in many of our digital systems. But, uh, social, but on the level of community, you can actually say transparency means creating spaces where people can show themselves without any disguise, where we can um, create at the core of, of um, even of cities, I would say, even though we are on the, on the countryside, but where on the core of social organization, you have communities that are small enough where people can, um, sh can practice truth, mutual support, and showing themselves to one another on a level um, where they are taken care for one another in a way that is intimate enough that they will actually dare to do that. And in, and in, 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 in thinking about that, um, the word trauma was mentioned. Uh, you have, we are facing a, a collective trauma of, of, um, of, of the culture that we come from. And so, and so we are seeing it is, it is not only um, therapy that I'm, that I'm talking about, but it is um, a, a real um, ambitious uh, question of, of design of human culture. How do we create forms of human coexistence that no longer perpetuate um, patterns of alienation, of um, systemic violence, um, of, of uh, separation between people, but where, um, so where people don't have to withdraw from society to, to go to a therapist to be cured, but actually where the participation in society is the cure per se. And maybe I will just end it on this note because I think my 10 minutes are up, but I would say a thriving um, human habitat or a thriving human culture is um, a culture where we, we see love and water as sacred. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Martin. You raised so many juicy topics. I hope we can come back to them in our dialogue. Thank you. So the next panelist I'd like to call on is Mark from Earthville. Mark, would you like to come forward? Hi, everyone. Good to be with you. Thanks, Marilyn. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Martin about a decade ago, give or take, when I was uh, at Tamara chaperoning a group of Tibetan monks uh, to, to, uh, to discover what was going on in this place, and particularly uh, with their solar village, which is doing some of the best work I've seen anywhere on the planet uh, in terms of natural energy uh, innovation. And, uh, and the monks were quite fascinated with the whole thing. We had some fascinating conversations. Uh, good to see you again. Um, so just a brief introduction for myself. Uh, my name is Mark Moore, um, originally from the US, but have spent um, about half my life, the better part of the last 25 years uh, in Asia, working and living there. Um, I'm the founder of the Earthville Network, a uh, local charitable organization with over a dozen uh, local scale projects in six countries. Um, since we started in 97, tens of thousands of wonderful students and volunteers from diverse backgrounds have joined our programs around the world. Um, and this rich diversity has provided a great abundance of learning for all of us, myself included, about how humans work together in community and what comes up along the way and how to navigate all this with sensitivity and uh, with fruitful results. Um, in a significant way, my story starts in Nepal. Um, when I was uh, 22, uh, senior in college, uh, I had, um, this crazy idea to uh, to do a study abroad program in Nepal um, that was a wonderful program from uh, my alma mater, Pitzer College in California. And this was such a profoundly life-changing experience. I was out in the high Himalayas living in a one room mud house with five other people and the chickens and the goats uh, with, a, with a roof so low, I couldn't quite stand up being a little taller than the rest of my family members there. And we got up every morning before dawn 
worked in the fields, harvested the barley, collected the firewood, and uh, went through the day working, playing, singing. And I learned living with the, these people five days climb away from the nearest road or the, the nearest electricity, where they were living the same as they were living 3,000 years ago. The only difference was one of them had a flashlight, a torch, you know. Um, everything else was as nature had created it. And so they were not only living sustainably, they were living as a part of nature, as one with nature. And though, you know, they have this, what, what we would academically call Buddhism, Hinduism, they had all of this, their real religion was nature, their spirit, spiritual connection was with nature. And living with these good people, I realized that somehow, despite being raised with love and opportunity and privilege, um, I also had a cultural inheritance of being too disconnected from nature. I'd, and I'd spent my whole life feeling homesick without realizing it until I'd found my way home. To come home to this sense of connection with nature has driven everything that I've been doing for the past 25 years since then. But what happened there in Nepal was um, as the, uh, as I spent more and more time just sort of relaxing and settling into this experience of living a life that is, rather than being disconnected from nature, is, is immersed in the lived experience of awareness of it. Um, I realized how many problems that solves all by itself because our own nature that we're gifted with as humans, our, our birthright is as naturally harmonious as everything else in nature, like the petals of a flower, like the veins uh, of a leaf. Our own internal wiring has that nature's brilliance in it. And the more we settle back into it, we naturally find ourselves uh, in a place where all of the hashtag first world problems that were troubling us before uh, begin to fade, begin to soften. The, the edges become a little softer and rounder. And we find ourselves in a more natural flow dealing with what we experience in ourselves and also with one another. So with that inspiration, um, I set out to cultivate um, practical pathways for this vision that was inspiring me to draw on Himalayan wisdom, to create models for our time and place. Um, and the next place that that led me was to India where I had a life-changing conversation with the Dalai Lama when I was 25 and got to talk with him about this idea of community and healthy human habitat and what I have come to call sustainable thriving. Um, and uh, with his uh, uh, very helpful, brilliantly insightful guidance, I started work on some projects uh, in the Himalayas uh, that, that has continued in the stream uh, since 1995. Uh, the current project uh, that has been my focus is called the Malaya Institute, um, which is a uh, six acre, three hectare uh, eco campus uh, in the Himalayas, where we have a variety of uh, programs uh, focused on empowering compassionate change makers uh, with, with concepts and solutions for compassionate living and sustainable thriving. And our, our beautiful campus uh, is, um, is built entirely by hand uh, with natural materials. I'll uh, bring up a little slide here. Okay. Oh, not working, Never mind. sorry. Uh, just come back.
Um, and the, the, um, the focus there is this question that Martin touched on, uh, that we've all been touching on, about how do we take this experience of um, tuning into our deeper nature and our connection with neighbor, nature and then scale that up on a community level. Um, how do we create an intentional community culture that holds as a central focus um, the returning home to that natural harmony that is our birthright. So uh, I think that's enough about me uh, I, because I'm really excited to hear everyone else and look forward to the dialogue. Thank you, Mark. That's a beautiful generative question you leave us with. Thank you. So our next panelist will be Beth Saunders in Edmonton, Canada. Beth. Hello, good morning, good evening, good day to everyone. Um, as Marilyn said, I'm, I'm here in Edmonton, Canada, so Western Canada, and I can see Catherine in the chat is in Spokane, so I'm about a six hour drive north, north of Catherine, fun to see a, a neighbor. Um, my, my work is essentially with cities, um, lots, lots of which I've done with my own city of Edmonton, who has a desire to be in conversation with itself. So my role in that work is to tune into what I refer to as the, the social habitat. So the quality of how we, how we interact with each other. And then of course, how that social habitat interacts with the work that we're each called to do. So our economic habitat, but also the physical or ecological habitat. Um, and then my, my, my side project where at the home where I live is I envision the little patch of land that I live on as a micro urban eco village. So that's a little bit about, about me. I'm gonna pull up some, some slides. Hang on just a gif. And let's hit play, there we go. So um, I, I, I had an urge to unpack Marilyn's question a little bit, which was how do we create solutions for thriving human habitats and simply think about the word how and what does, what does how mean? So I, it ended up taking me to four other questions. So um, who, who is involved in making healthy human habitats or, or what are the ingredients to do that? What are the, the process qualities or what are the, the necessary conditions? So I'm gonna spend my little chunk of time sharing with you where my, where my brain went a little bit with those, with those questions. And Marilyn touched a little bit in her presentation on, on this how piece. And I just wanna shine another, another light on it because uh, in, in practicality in the work that I'm doing um, in my city in particular, is whether we're talking about um, a new development going in in the middle of a neighborhood and the conflict that comes with that, or we're talking about changing the rules across the entire city about how high buildings can be or what they're made of or who lives in them. Um, these four voices that Marilyn named about the citizens, the civic managers, the civic builders, civic organizations are all absolutely essentially different and each one is not homogenous, but there's some similarities in each of those, like within each voice. And magic happens when they're allowed to hear their own voice. And then I always know there's magic happening when they start to demand to hear each other's voices. So that's one of the who that play with. Um, the other part of the who is just playing with the, with the scale at which we're, we're working with. So at the scale of the individual or the citizen, Marilyn had this, this concentric circles in the little film that she played. This is just another way of, of relaying it, but it's from the individual up to the eco region. And the eco region of course could be quite immediate 
or it could be as big as the planet or beyond. So that's a little bit about how I play with who is involved. When it gets to the, the, um, the ingredients, I think a lot about the quality of the, of the interaction or as Mark was just speaking to and Martin did a little bit too about the, the conflict that comes with living with other, with other humans. So are we, are we able to create the conditions where um, conflict is generative rather than avoided, where we, we find our way to walk into it and explore it? Um, and that means we have to meet in quite radically different ways. We're not doing that right now because we're, we're in a platform where we're delivering. But whenever possible, when we can create the conditions for the, all of the pieces of the system, which are the citizens, the businesses, the community organizations, our public institutions, to actually interact with each other, that's when I find the, the magic happens. And it always seems to work well. There's another ingredient here about having really good really good questions for people to guide them. So some projects I've worked on lately, um, one was um, wanting to figure out how in our city where it's primarily single family dwellings, so families living separately on their own, how could we rewrite the rules to enable more people to be in those neighborhoods? And there was a lot of conflict about this. And we just crafted a simple question. How do we welcome more people in our older neighborhoods? And we ended up with a massive action plan um, to take place over two years, largely which is, is happening. And I, we can see some tangible things happening. Another question um, that we're in right now in Edmonton is how do we make Edmonton's energy transition happen in a just and equitable and prosperous way? And that question guides the work that we're doing with, um, with Edmonton, Edmontonians across the city. So after ingredients, there's this question for me around how about like process kind of how and what are the what are the qualities and one of the ways that I like to think about it is process wise it's important to have a sense of destination where is it that we're going and then realizing that we're always on a learning journey on the way to reach that destination and things change along the way emergence happens um, and we never actually usually, unless it's a very close in destination, actually reach the destination that we set out to reach, which then um, I tend to play with, and they're not the same thing, but it's important to have a sense of destination where we're going, but it's also important to have a sense of direction. And when we're aware of destinations in the plural, we're able to discern the, the direction we, we'd like to move in which of course means we need feedback loops and, and that's an important process quality as well. Um, and then that last question I had for myself is what are, the, what are the necessary conditions? And it all seems to revolve around the word story for me. What is the story or the narrative that we're in? Um, what aspects of that are healthy or unhealthy? What is the new story that we're, we're wanting to be in? Um, these are all things to talk about in our in our social habitat, which enables us to embody um, and more energetically then live into the, the direction, the sense of direction that we're looking for. And the story touches on various aspects of our lives. So um, that's another piece that I contemplate. And at the end of the day, a healthy human habitat um, comes about when the work that we do, our economic life, is actually in connection with the physical habitat, so not separated from. Um, and there was a moment quite a, quite a number of years ago where I was, I was scribbling and, and playing and my brain latched onto something that the Brundtland Commission Venn diagram for economic, social, ecological, physical, whatever language you want to use, as concentric circles whether the physical is in the middle or economics uh, on the outside, what's in between is our social habitat. And I view it kind of like a, like a valve. It's, it's either off and shut off. And then the work that we do in our ecological natural world like, is not in contact because we have to be willing and aware of those feedback loops. And I think the last piece I'd like to leave um, us with is the notion that tension and conflict in our cities is healthy 
it's necessary. Um, that tension is an evolutionary driver that compels us to improve the things around us. And I find that that framing is, is really helpful to understand that when I see that something's wrong, what it really is, is an opportunity to improve. And once those improvements are made, something wrong always comes back. So it's never a clean slate. Um, and understanding that helps me at any rate be at, at peace with, with things. Um, and at the end of the day, I view cities as um, entities that are there to serve citizens. And citizens, we all have a role to serve cities. And when we step into that role, we can create cities that serve us. And of course, that is always, always needs to be in good relationship with all forms of life. And I'll, I'll leave, I'll stop there, Marilyn. Thanks, Beth. That's great. Love your diagrams with the, the uh, Nest City. Very cheerful and yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so we'll <clears throat> move from your Nest now to our next panelist. And our next panelist is Kirsten Miller. Kirsten is the ED of Eco City Builders and she's been the co-convener of many Eco City World Summits. So Kirsten, bring us into a maybe different scale of looking at human habitats and how they thrive from your perspective. Great, thank you, Marilyn. Hello everyone, I'm delighted to be joining all of you today. And I'm excited to share with you some of the work of Eco City Builders and I have a tale of two cities to share with you. Um, one is from the United States and it reflects, um, you'll see in the end, maybe not the best outcome, but it was a learning experience that I would love to get some of your insights and feedback about. So I'm asking for a little bit of help. <laughs> and then the other one is um, another city where things are, are going great. Uh, so I just wanted to give you an example of um, two types of processes based on the same sort of framework, but they're in different places. Um, and it'd be wonderful to um, get the reflections of this community about those processes. So I'm going to share my screen. And Marilyn, could you please give me like a, a heads up when my time is out? Because <laughs> I may not, you know, may not have that sure. awareness. Can, can you see my, my image? Yes. Yeah, so I can just give you a one okay. minute to go. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. All right, so I'm gonna share. And can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, so we are Eco City Builders. We're based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Our founder um, is Richard Register, who is an early urban ecologist, and some of you may know about his work. The early days of Eco City Builders were mostly based in Berkeley, California, with um, citizen activists getting together with local government, with um, planners, designers, architects, and really physically uh, changing um, aspects of their of neighborhoods. So daylighting creeks and creating early slow streets for bicycles, um, advocating for infill, uh, a lot of really exciting early projects. So the early eco city builders sort of um, created a definition for uh, a, a logic behind what is this idea of eco city and this is the working definition um, that we have currently so an eco city we say is a human settlement modeled on the self-sustaining resilient structure and function of natural ecosystems and living organisms the eco city provides healthy abundance to its inhabitants without consuming more renewable resources than it produces, without producing more waste than it can assimilate, and without being toxic to itself or neighboring ecosystems. Its inhabitants' ecological impacts reflect planetary supportive lifestyles. Its social order reflects fundamental principles of fairness, justice, and reasonable equity. So with that, we sort of take a look at the city as a, a system. 
it's the built environment, but it's also the other ecosystems that keep it alive with continuous flows that um, come from outside of its borders, but are, are flowing uh, through it. Um, and without it, the city wouldn't really exist. But within the city itself, it has these dynamics that I think um, the people in your communities talk about very beautifully and uh, in ways that it's, it's really important to understand. Um, so, the work of Eco City Builders is really a, a process that never stops <laughs> and um, it, it's consistently reflecting um, on these dynamics. So we've then um, integrated this thinking and this logic into what we call a, a, the Eco City Framework. So as uh, cities and definitely within cities, uh, neighborhoods within cities, we're trying to work together in a participatory way to move from wherever that neighborhood, that city is to what we call it an eco city um, condition. And that is definitely um, something that needs to be co-created with the citizens who live there. So that's sort of the, the what we do first when we start working with a neighborhood and a city is to, to sort of um, get their uh, take on how the city is doing and where it is, what the priorities need to be, what sorts of targets um, would be the best to sort of um, step forward and start working on first. Um, and this we find is uh, a good way for us to move forward uh, with a, a project. So the, definitely we're looking at uh, creating self-sustaining city systems. And this is a, a nice little uh, sketch by our founder, Richard Register. It, it's looking at the San Francisco Bay Area as like a series of eco cities. Um, so it's inspirational. So we definitely, in the way that we work, um, we're, we, we're mapping, we're collecting data, we're trying to get this intelligence from the community that actually gives us information about resource flows and how they are different in different parts of the city. So each neighborhood really has um, a, a different microclimate, a different set of people living there, uh, different uh, access to resources, et cetera. So we try to um, weave together both the um, surveys of asking people how things are going in the neighborhood, but we're also doing um, audits, parcel audits to get hard data from the bottom up about you know how resources are moving through that specific area. And we also collect data and information from local governments, uh, regional and national data to try to get like a, a more well-rounded picture of what's going on. So this is the first tale of the city of Oakland. <laughs> So our, um, what we set out to do was to reimagine Oakland, California as a series of urban villages. And these urban villages really um, harken back to the days before uh, automobiles sort of took over the city. And each of these centers of the villages we found were places where the streetcar system used to have uh, stations. So those were already the underlying natural hubs of where if we reimagined Oakland as urban villages, each with their own culture, their micro economies, micro climates, you can see the layer of the, the urban streams that had been built over. We were um, talking to uh, these different neighborhoods and starting the process of reimagining uh, Oakland as urban villages. And our first, I'm gonna tell you the story about West Oakland, um, a largely uh, African-American community that's by the port. So 
This is the uh, West Oakland's uh, boundaries. Uh, it's the, the place is talked about as the Village Bottoms community. Um, it was a place that was experienced redlining um, throughout the history of Oakland, meaning that the city didn't really provide services to this part of the city because it was largely African Americans and um, you know, it was discrimination. Um, it was also torn apart when the um, Metro, the BART system was put in. So um, hundreds of homes were just bulldozed. <laughs> so, um, so what happened is EcoCity Builders set in to create a community plan with the residents of this community that was um, took into account the history, the culture, the what, um, what vision they had for it um, into the future. And it was, it touched upon all of these um, sorts of processes that you've all discussed and very excitingly um, came up with a, a beautiful vision, but unfortunately, what happened was um, it was sort of just defeated by um, other local government processes. Um, the city of San Francisco decided that it was going to be a bedroom community for the city of San Francisco worker tech workers. So I'm gonna, I have to end my, um, my talk because I'm out of time. I wanted to share with you the other example of something that did work, <laughs> but I don't have time. To, but anyway, this is, um, I would love to get people's reflections if I can about um, how do we move forward in this really divisive, unfortunate um, circumstance, especially in the United States with these um, different cultures really clashing and people with money really not having very much compassion to uh, an emerging hive um, and would rather sort of stamp it out than support it. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry I didn't manage my time very well because I wanted to sh share with you some really good examples, which we do have as well, but um, maybe I'll just um, stop with this. So thank you so much. Marilyn. Thank you, Kristen. Everyone <laughs> has such, such really rich presentations. Yeah. And, and thank you for just bringing it into that focus around Oakland, which it looks like a lot of people in the chat are familiar with. And, and I personally also know uh, something about. So it's a great question that you leave us with. So we'll come back to that. Thank you. Um, and now we'll listen to our last panelist, which is who is Lalit. Kishore Bhatti, who is an urban planner in Oroville in India. Lalit, would you like to take center stage? Yes, thank you very much, Marilyn. I have been listening to all the presentations and it is a very rewarding to hear what all efforts are being made all over the world. Very, very, very inspiring. So I'll directly enter into uh, in my presentation You can uh, you can see it. It's still starting. It says double click yeah. to enter full screen mode. There you go. It's fine now. Um, you're not on full screen mode yet. You're still showing. The, okay. Yeah, there you go. That's it. That's fine. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful forum. My name is Lalit Kishore Bhatti. I'm an architect and urban planner by profession. And I am living in Auroville for last 20 plus years. So when I joined here as, uh, and, and as a planner, it was a great unlearning experience for me coming back, coming from a normal, say conventional planning education background and seeing what this community is doing in and which kind of efforts are being made and what is the overall cultural and living system and charter. So this has been a personally very rewarding and very, very special learning journey for me and also for my family and fellow community members. I'll start with this. What Sri Aurobindo says, the true knowledge is not 
attain by thinking it is what you are and what you become so this will help us to see the larger context and he also says all problems are essentially the problem of harmony uh, oroville is based on spiritual vision of mother and shirobindo uh, they have talked about the human evolution human consciousness evolution the next stage of human development and mother the founder of oroville she gave the charter to oroville uh, which talks about oroville belongs to nobody in particular but humanity as a whole oroville will be a place of unending education of constant progress and youth that never ages oroville would be the bridge between the past and the future and the place for material and spiritual researches for the living embodiment of an actual human unity Oroville was inaugurated 28th February 1968, so it's only 50 years young. So this was an inauguration moment. Uh, some 123 uh, uh, countries, the people representing them, and the states of India at that point in time, they brought handful of earth which was placed in this urn, and this was a symbolic and actual beginning of Oroville 50 years back. there are very few places when we talk about the city civilizations where one can see which have started with almost close to no water condition or in a very degraded land condition so if we see the history what we are talking is a very different curve oroville started on the other side of curve these were the conditions so even if the aim and objective of oroville were very high very special very universal the the actual ground conditions were these what you can see on the screen it was a almost a very vast waste degraded barren land condition very poor vegetation and eroded land so with 20 years of effort so these were the conditions this will give you an idea how the situation was and at that point in time there were only handful of volunteers oroville is we all are volunteers here so oroville has been working based on the volunteer energy and what has happened in the last in the first 20 year of its existence with lots of careful plantation soil and water conservation work this whole larger area has been converted into a lush green forest what happens when a forest comes is a, is a subject which is very well known to i think most of us here microclimate changes it brings changes in the socio economic condition we have many villages the local native villages in this area the change has been very very far and very very percolating on many many grounds some of the images which one can see here how this area looks now this is a relatively recent photo matri mandir is the center of if we see uh, if i have been hearing to previous speakers also so it is very important to know your center and fix the center so from a very collective point of view uh, mother had already fixed the center of oroville which is matri mandir in the peace area so as compared to many cities when we talk about downtowns when the energy is very competitive and alive in a very different way uh, the trade and commerce oroville center is fixed around peace area a place for self reflection and self finding so that also defines even the planning terminology this integral living perspective and the state of aim of oroville is human unity so right now we are approximately 3000 people from 55 countries and the proposed population of oroville is 50000 and there is a plan which has also been approved by the resident assembly of oroville also the government of india one particular department with which oroville is also linked to it has the central circle is a city area surrounded by the green belt and which also has the villages so it's a place for coexistence oroville has been very well aware that it cannot exist in isolation so has been working on a larger watershed region which we also call bio region uh, on the food water natural resources on many many aspects so oroville has many many outreach activities and how the food is grown we have many farms there is a large population which is actively engaged in green activities both farming and forest and they have been the predominant activities in the beginning years of oroville and all this what we are seeing is a work of handful of volunteers 
very dedicated, very committed and driven by their self energy and the faith in the vision of Auroville. Uh, Auroville has been working on different uh, water management practices, whether it's a percolation and all the developments have to have the wastewater treatment plant, which are locally designed a fairly uh, good name in terms of practicing and experimenting with renewable energy applications. This is one of the biggest solar bowl when it was made. This is attached to the solar kitchen, our collective community dining, and all this has been designed and done locally. In the bottom left, you see the images of a wind farm. So there are some winds which are associated with Auroville and all the energy supplied from there. So technically all the Auroville's energy usage is taken care of by the supply from these windmills, which are in further south. So I would like to mention and highlight and make it also very child centric from a metaphor point of view. There is a saying, one needs a village to raise a child. So the whole surroundings, the whole development, the whole society's perspective towards as a learning society remains very crucial. And mother talks about the five layers, five elements of integral education, the physical, mental, vital, spiritual, and psychic. So these are the uh, elements on which I think Auroville education, Auroville activities are worked. And the, the whole schooling system is working towards this provide children this kind of learning and living environment. And Sri Aurobindo also says the seed of holistic growth is within all of us and all supporting systems, the teacher, the society needs to create possibility of nurturing the inner talent which each child has. So the whole learning, the design of buildings, many things here are around those approaches. You can see the images of the different buildings, the kind of architecture which is done. So Auroville creates a sense of freedom a sense of belonging to a new idea, new possibilities, and each different, each person feels empowered to carry out whatever they feel, their passion, their liking, their own swadharma. So fairly well known in terms of alternative construction technologies, low embedded energy buildings, one of the housings. And our decision making is done in a very consensus based way, community participation process. So this is the way final decisions are made. Before any decision or resolution reaches this stage, huge process, sometime it can run into a, almost a year. One year time it may take different drafts, community meetings, uh, radio on intranet, pub, journal meetings are held before the final resolutions come. So this is a fairly well established way. Uh, this is our waste management practices. So these are some of the faculty members from a college, university, those who have been coming, many people, almost thousands of people, interns, volunteers, researchers, movie makers, they come very regularly to Auroville to, to see, learn from uh, how this whole integral living system is being experimented upon. Auroville has been supported by UNESCO by many resolutions and also mentioned as a ray of hope for humanity. And uh, we also write in our own description sometime the city the earth needs. So all this information, which I'm also saying is easily available on Auroville's main website. This is an image from a school, last school, which works uh, towards the aim is taken as a perfectibility for a man and not, a, not as a, a way to earn the livelihood or degree. So it should be a joy of learning. So this particular school also uh, gears towards that, they aim for this. Understanding the local mapping condition, there's some of us, those who have been working in the planning, this map shows the overlay of water, water systems, local water system, soil type, percolation. So some of these maps are used, the local conditions are seen whenever the next development takes place. There has been a very interesting exercise and I can share later with some of the people, those who want to have access to this information. Most of this information is on the main Auroville website, but if you want, my email will be coming in the end. You can write to me and I'll be happy to provide. So here there was an exercise on integral sustainability platform. One can see in this circle, all different sectors of life and walk, which Marilyn and many other people have talked about. We had people working in each sector as a team, worked for almost more than a year, and they came together with a vision idea plan of each sector and they interacted with each other. So kind of ecological principle, how nature works with each other. And to, with this, a report has been prepared, which I'll be happy to share if people are interested. So these are some of the earth. 
so the future of learning relates with the future of integral living so this is one of the key element which we have to keep in mind when we talk about Malik, the growth of societies me. or the future my time Malik, is up I, yes i'm afraid so it's so rich as is everybody else's thank you and we will provide the links to you so um sure. thank you if there's one more thing you wanted to say i think you've just been tempting us to keep going deeper and so further so i can go to the last i can go to the last slide if you feel like i can or is it we can end it here also we can end it here and let's open up right. a conversation yeah with everyone thank you. thank you thank you More so, so. Thank you. So if I can call everyone back into turning their cameras on so we can have a conversation where we can see each other. We had earlier some questions that I sent out to you, but I feel like what I would really like to do as we've listened to each other is um, maybe to invite um, what we've noticed as themes that have emerged as in what people have shared, one, one of the things that has really struck me is how close that our imaginations or our work is, links our human habitats to nature. Um, and I wonder if you might like to notice how the work that you're doing um, might be um, inspired by some of the other work that you've learned about on, from, the, from the panelists. And uh, yeah, who would like to start? Who, who's been inspired by hearing something from one of the others? Mark, you're looking speculative. I'm going to call on you. Oh, um, one of the things that I love um, about what I've heard from everyone is um, the recognition of all of us as individuals and as communities as a system. So everything in nature uh, is a system and each of us as individuals are a system within a system. And we, it's uh, delightful for my mind, uh, it tickles me to have a panel full of systems thinkers uh, who also have heart uh, because it's very easy in the world of um, those of us who are passionate about conceptualizing uh, models for uh, community, for healthy human habitat, to get lost in the models and, um, and, and forget the heart that is the reason for doing everything that we do. And I'm happy to be here with a group of people who remember that the heart is the point. Um, we're all talking about love and we're all talking about how to organize love and scale it uh, to a community level. And I see that each of you are doing that uh, in your own unique ways and uh, each has made a great contribution. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mark. That's beautiful. And, and heart intelligence is something that's come out with many of the prior speakers on Humanity Rising too. But thanks for making that observation. Anybody else want to go next? Um, what struck you about the themes that are running through our sharing? Kirsten, you yeah. unmuted yourself. I, I've unmuted. <laughs> um, well, I, I really appreciate um, the perspective of this community. Um, it's, it's one that has so much in common with the Eco City movement, but the eco villages and the people who've sort of boldly gone out and created these sort of um, test communities that now have decades of experience uh, being able to organize and um, learn that these are special um, intelligences that I think more uh, of the people who are in sort of like the regular uh, city um, spaces need to be able to learn more from because um, back to the experience of Oakland that I just wanted that I shared with you. Um, by the way, we use the same framework in many other countries and have much better success in cultures that are more uh, similar, like more mono type of cultures. But in the case of Oakland, where you have like very different cultures and identities and 
visions and then also real estate markets and, you know, business expansion, um, it's very difficult for, I feel, a vision and a new way to rise up and actually have a chance to thrive. And so any sort of insights on how to like, I know there's a tipping point, but um, how do in the, especially in the United States and other places that are really um, undergoing these, you know, systems that are really disconnected how, how do we generate enough of this positive momentum that we overcome the, the old system that kind of comes and smashes down on us? Mm -hmm. Any, any advice would be that's a, uh, really That's a beautiful question. I'm going to confess I didn't introduce myself at the beginning of saying that I actually live in Findhorn in the oldest eco village in the UK. And um, many people might ask, why did you take your Integral City work to an eco-village? And it's exactly for the reason that you're talking about. I felt that by learning how the eco-village had started and the pictures that Lalit showed of Oroville um, are very similar to how Fintorn started. We started from the dunes, from the desert. There was nothing here. And now I'm surrounded by, you know, a whole set of gardens that have flourished a lot this year because people have been staying home. But I, I think it's really an interesting question, Kirsten, because um, in the developed world, something like 90% of humanity lives in cities. And so having to reinvent the cities is really a challenge that we face. And I might ask maybe Beth if she might like to comment on that because you're working in um, a city that has um, not quite as old uh, uh, infrastructure as Oakland, but maybe somewhat similar. Um, definitely not as old, but yet the, the North American experience of settlers arriving and setting up settlements and invading, that's what colonization is. Um, yet all of that done so, and my, I'll just focus on my experience in North America, done so without tuning into the natural world. So when there's a disconnect between the work that we do and the natural world, um, then it can be really hard. And this is the conflict that we live in my city. So I'm in Alberta and Western Canada. The economy is driven by the, by the oil sands and has been for oil and gas for decades. So we're like the ultimate <laughs> <laughs> transition town right that also is having a hard time psychologically wrapping itself around the idea of a different kind of energy system so it's an interesting little little hotbed to be in um, but there's there's so much that needs to happen around like it, it feels to me like an ex existential crisis for individuals and then it scales up around sense of identity um, of course, um, if I work in oil and gas, I need to, I'm, I'm worried about livelihood. So I'm going to cling to coal, I'm coal rather, I'm going to cling to oil as my livelihood. And yet what we're, what we're, what we're in and the pandemic is like the Petri dish of showing us how quickly we can shift and do things differently. Like what are the, what are the social conditions in which I as an individual or my family, or my neighborhood, my city, my species can start to feel confident with some experimentation of trying out new things. But that only is going to come about if we handle each other with care and compassion rather than rather than hatred and and finding the ways, you know, relationship by relationship, conversation by conversation to address. Um, everything that is being revealed at these times, whether it's inequities, power imbalances, um, total disconnect from, from natural processes. Um, but I think for humanity, like we're not going to get away from cities. We could have a whole bunch of people leave big cities and destroy the planet. Like leaving big cities is not going to be helpful because we can replicate a whole bunch of small towns that gobble up um, farmland, forest land. So it's not the answer. The answer is figuring out, um, as I always say with my city planner hat on, you know, like density is not the devil. It's, it's, it's the design and how we 
integrate it into our lives and accept it and be in relationship with people and learn how to handle conflict and tension. Anyway, I'll stop there, Marilyn. Yeah, well, thank you, Beth, because that gives me a nice segue to invite Martin into the discussion. I've been uh, quite intrigued with the articles you've written for Cosmos Journal, which has really explored our, our VUCA world in very sort of um, deep and reflective ways. And you've also spoken earlier on humanity rising about Tamara and how care is really an important um, way of life there. You mentioned in your own presentation today how you're also addressing conflict through connecting through, you, you talked about water regeneration. Can you maybe connect up a few of these um, ideas and passions that you have? <laughs> I'll try my best. Thank you. Um, well, actually, I would just like to continue on the line that Beth just spoke, and then I will come to the question that you just uh, asked to me. Because, yeah, I think uh, what this conversation really points towards is it is uh, it is really about how do we, in what kind of relationship are we with the, with the land that we inhabit ultimately. So it's as, as Beth said, it's not about it's not about density, but it's really about design. It's about in what kind of contact are we? And if we haven't learned as, or if we have forgotten rather as, as people to, to really honor um, and take a conscious role in the ecosystem that we play, then we, we will continue to, to destroy that. And um, so I would like to just read a, two sentences from a, a letter that some of you might know um, that um, a Potawatomi botanist called Robin Wall Kimmerer wrote, uh, where she basically um, reaches out to um, people that have come from colonizer lineages and where she says, um, right now you can choose to set aside the minds of, of the colonizer and become native to place. You can choose to belong. And then there is this very... Um, this line that I find amazing where she says in, in a time of great polarity and division the common ground we, gra we crave is in fact beneath our feet the very land on which we stand is our foundation and can be a source of shared identity and common cause and this is obviously uh, spoken from a, from a uh, whole cosmology and, and uh, cultural background of indigenous peoples. But for me, this really sums up uh, a lot of, of the cultural shift that, that is necessary and also reorientation for people if we, if we actually want to um, rediscover the principle of community because it's, and this is also maybe a segue to your question on conflict, because I think if we understand community in too narrow, just uh, an interpersonal way, um, I think it's very easy to just get caught up in endless circling and processing um, among human beings, but there is something that becomes more, maybe an objective is not the right word, but, some, but there, is a, there, is a, there is a bigger orientation when we as humans discover our, our role, our, our, our necessity in the, in the bigger ecosystem. And, um, and in that sense, I would say that uh, yeah, it was also mentioned earlier that, that conflict is part of life. Conflict is part of our evolution. I think conflict is inevitable. And if we try to avoid it, um, it will just lead to more um, explosions and disruptions. Um, but the question is, do, um, do people actually accept one another? Um, because if they, if they cannot, um, if, they, if they constantly have the feeling they have to struggle for for survival in, in society, then whatever conflict we have will have that charge, um, you know, where we, where if people cannot accept one another, they will, they will fight, they will compete. And so I think there is a very deep meaning of creating spaces where people can come together in a way where they actually can acknowledge one another. And this is not only functional. So I, you know, whatever work you do, um, you know, I, I, I see you in the societal role, but actually we are, we are in many ways um, beings that come with the soul. So I, I think there is also a, a deep spiritual dimension in, in, mm. in how we recognize one another. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I leave so it in, there. 
so in connecting to that which is more than human it's not just nature but a whole spiritual dimension and in some ways uh, what you and beth are pointing to in, in around conflict it reminds me of a quote that uh, I've used from Patrick Geddes. And he says, a city is more than a place in space. It is a drama in time. And it sort of is a beautiful little way of imagining the role that I think evolution is playing. If, if um, James Lovelock says that we have actually been evolved by Gaia and he proposes as her reflective organ, as a very young species, we're still trying to figure out how we can possibly be of service there. I like to draw Lalit in because he actually referred to something I've wrote, written a whole series of blogs on that you might have a good laugh at. But when I was in uh, Oroville in the fall, I was very taken by Aurobindo and the mother's idea that cities should be right-sized at 50,000 people. So I did, he had even the math figured out for India, 20,000 cities of 50,000 people. So um, I've been thinking about that a lot and wondering if that is a way that we are going to evolve our cities of the future, even the large ones like Kristen is looking at with Oakland and San Francisco, never mind New Delhi or um, the large cities in India. Is it possible for us to rethink it, rethink city and human habitat that radically that we could get back to both nature and spirit in a way that is fulfilling for all the human systems and living systems right up to Gaia. Malit, I'll draw you in. Uh, what I would, you can hear me well? Yes. Okay. So what I would like to share on this part is, I would like to go back to the image which I have shown, if people remember, about the integral education diagram of mother, the fivefold. And if you look at that carefully, it talks about the growth of an, of an individual right from a very childhood stage to physical, mental, vital, psychic. So these are the planes of growth which we all should ideally be experiencing going through. So they, they also add to a certain level of capacity to deal with the complexity and uh, to be able to work out an organizational system which can allow the growth, the openness, and whatever all good things we have been talking about in terms of coexistence, self-governance, sense of freedom. My reading has been looking at the kind of cities, particularly if you see the nature of cities, particularly in Indian context, how they have evolved whether it is a migration, there are many other factors, those who are coming to live there. So I would still emphasize the need of giving a possibility of education, the learning opportunity. I think a society, if a city, the one of the phrases which I have been using quite openly is the city is a living curriculum. So if we mm. weave it around this, if city, if, if there is a focus on the city as a living curriculum, and all the organizations, the government, the NGOs, the organize, there are many institutions in any city. If they all play their role to enrich the life of the city and the learning content, I think that can create the possibility of do our best. We try to relate with it when we see that there is a larger alignment. There is an alignment of sense of purpose. So if we can create that, so it's a more of a soft intent, the capacity of the people to come together and some people's capacity to organize and facilitate something like this. So I would relate and keep it more on the line that and able to create a kind of charter. We, we are all very diverse people in Auroville and we have all kinds of possible problems and issues, but it is taken as that these are the issues on which we are supposed to be working. So it's a very known and conscious effort in that direction. And the charter of Auroville, the four point which I mentioned, we all try to relate with them we have our personal interpretation, but a larger spiritual intent and alignment respect the human value in each other. So those are the things, if we can create the possibility of those or. Yes. So what I hear you saying, Lalit, is the importance of the spiritual life and also that cities have a purpose which is also something that I hold 
as a way that cities are able to serve Gaia. We've had lots of interesting discussion in the chat and also in Q&A that has even brought up the Paris Agreement and the role that they might be playing, the SDGs might be playing in cities. And what I would like to suggest is that's a whole other session because uh, given the time that uh, Jim gave us, um, we're going to have to draw our conversation to a close. Lalit, I hope that you can come back on. I'm not sure if the um, Zoom connection in your place has dropped you off the line, but maybe you can try coming back in. I, I would just like to thank the panelists for bringing not only the richness of your work, but some wonderful questions that you have enlivened our space with. You've brought um, the whole opportunity for us to think regeneratively so that we're not only of service to how Gaia has evolved us now, but how can we actually regenerate and take, um, create the conditions for uh, our next generations, which again, would be a whole other conversation. So Jim, in, um, in the nice legacy that you've created and conditions with um, humanity rising, you started on May the 22nd and said you would keep it as an uncertain end. So it may become an evolutionary phenomenon of its own. Anyway, <laughs> I would like to thank all of the, the panelists and um, just hand it over to Jim and see if he has any further comments or questions or observations to make of what we've shared today about thriving human habitats. Well, thank you so much, uh, Marilyn. Uh, I would love to uh, talk with you further and various members of the panel about some kind of follow-up because the challenge for the human race under current rather stark conditions of duress to develop thriving human habitats could not be more critical and could not be more challenging. And as I've been listening to the panel, it seems to me um, that uh, there are really four major domains that humanity needs to deal with in thinking about habitat. One, uh, I think it was Martin that pointed out there was this nature and then people. You know, a community has to be ecologically aligned uh, but it also has to organize itself so that the people involved uh, get along with one another. And uh, if you remember Sartre's, Jean-Paul Sartre's great uh, definition of hell, he says it was other people. You know, and it may be that humanity finds itself um, that it's easier to get along with nature than <laughs> to get along, you know, with each other. And you know, I'd love to have a, a whole conversation with you, uh, Lalit, at some point about how uh, Oroville, which is, I think, the largest and one of the oldest of the um, sort of the light communities, has figured this out. You know, and this leads to a, a, a third, I think, really important factor as we think about uh, thriving habitats, and that's simply how many people they are. There are. You know, we're way past, we could have the Finhorns in the Oroville's, but there's eight going on nine, 10 billion people out there, most of which are urban, most of which have very little connection with nature, most of which are very susceptible to um, social media, fake news, uh, commercialization, commodification, uh, because of the lack of education. So. Uh, it's one thing to have a light community of self-intentioned people coming together, like Auroville is, but then how do you deal with India with 1.3, 1.4 billion people? And then fourthly, not only do we have to deal with nature and we have to deal with other people in a burgeoning population, which by the way, is getting younger and younger and younger. 40% of the entire population of Africa now is under 25 years old. 
And these young people are just coming into the world full of expectations, but not being equipped with the mindsets or tool sets or skill sets they need to really navigate either hyper complexity or come together to solve global challenges. Um, and then you've got this issue of technology. I mean, one of the themes that's been up on a number of the recent panels is this 5G network that's being built and the impact that 20,000 satellites above the earth now covering almost every square meter of the planet with major uh, electromagnetic pulses. What's that doing to the ecosystem? What is that doing to people's physiology, people's mental states, people's emotional uh, capacities? When the more we're finding out, the more we're realizing that this stuff has effects. So, you know, how humanity um, understands the complexity, first of all, of what we're all in at the moment, and then begins to sort out how we can learn from the Findhorns and the Tamaras and the Orvilles of the world, but adapt it at scale with people that aren't spiritually or mentally or emotionally anywhere near the caliber of the people in the light community, that's a real challenge. And that's one reason, by the way, we're, we're so delighted that um, uh, donut economics has emerged in major cities like Amsterdam and Copenhagen and a variety of other um, uh, uh, communities. Uh, apparently there's 400 now that are interested in pursuing donut economics. And that leads, I think, to the, the final point that I want to make, and I've just learned so much from you, you folks tonight, is I think it may have been Beth, I'm not sure, that said, we've got to have a new story. I mean, if you think about it, we could solve everything if we just came up with a new story. And I, Exhibit A is what we've just done with the pandemic. Think about it just for a minute, everybody. In a matter of weeks, the entire human race, for the most part, once they learned about the pandemic, they told themselves a whole new story. We got to lock down, we got to engage in uh, social distancing, and we got to really start to watch our hygiene. And we just watched billions of people embrace a story, a narrative, and everybody did the same thing simultaneously. That's worth considering. That's worth considering. That if somehow we can move simultaneously on the level of, of, you know, city planning and economics and, you know, the technology and so forth of building and roads and infrastructure and what you have to do, but within a new storyline, that would be an amazing, amazing thing. And, and one of the things that I think is coming out of Kate Rayworth's work on donut economics which is so simple, anybody can understand it. The inner circle of the donut is human well-being, which we're all agreeing on. And the other, the outer circle of the donut is ecological systems and constraints. You develop human well-being within the context of the overall ecology and constraints like climate change, like water scarcity, et cetera. And you begin to have a whole new model, a whole new understanding of how human beings can define themselves and, and interact. So anyway, these are just a few of the issues that you folks have teased out today. And that's why Marilyn, I would love it if, uh, even if this same panel would meet again, maybe a month or two down the road, 
on a, on a, on a, on a, on another question of this because you're you're grappling with what we call in the states the sixty four thousand dollar question. <laughs> How do we, <laughs> under current circumstances, develop thriving human communities? So I just want to thank uh, everybody on this panel. This has been, this has really been uh, uh, superb. Um, so thank you, everyone. Tomorrow, uh, we're going to turn uh, to this whole question of sustainability and spirituality uh, as another uh, group of people come together again, to just really ponder um, the solutions that we need to implement within the framework of a new narrative, a new mindset, a new consciousness um, that is necessary as we reshape the world. Uh, so we meet uh, same time, same station every day between five o'clock and seven o'clock p.m. Central uh, European time. Uh, and we'll see you uh, all uh, again tomorrow. Thank you so much. And Marilyn, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure, Jim. And thank all the panelists. They're just wonderful. Thank you. Bye. I love what you had to say, uh, uh, Lalit, about uh, Oroville. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Most welcome. Thanks for this opportunity. And Tamara. It's great, great, great work, Martin. Be well, everyone. Thank Bye. you, Jim. Thank Bye, you. Jim. Bye, Bye. Bye, Richard. Bye, Beth. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Mark. Bye, Lalit. Bye, Mark. Bye, Bye Mark. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Mary. Bye, everyone. Bye, Kirsten. Thanks. Bye, Jim. Bye, bye. I could not answer one or two questions which were posed to me personally. So I don't know, maybe I can respond to them in some other ways. That's fine. Thank you. Great session. I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you, Thank Marilyn. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, Bye, Lynn.